a little closer so people can stand. in a little closer, stand under the tent, behind the chair. Does anybody need a yarmulke? Anybody need a kippah? this morning. There are still a few chairs if anyone needs to sit. I think that all of us knew that this day was going to come, but it came so quickly. And in that sense, it was unexpected. We thought we had a bit more time to sit with Jerry, to visit with him, to help this family prepare for this moment and support each other. It's no, so now we need to do that now. And our gathering together is an important part of that. It's not just about saying prayers. That's, of course, part of a Jewish funeral, but far more than the saying of prayers, it is the being a prayer. It's being that sacred and holy presence in the lives of each other. When I sat with the family yesterday, we talked about how we keep Jerry alive in this world by remembering him and drawing lessons from his life realizing what we do and, or how we see the world because that's how he saw it. The routines that he went through, the organization that he had about everything. Every time we go through maybe our own routines, every time we put something back right in the place where it belongs, as Jerry was so often to do, maybe we will think, well, my friend Jerry did that too. And to turn our hearts to this family, support them in this moment 
and moments of grief. To remember him, as our tradition says, to remember him for blessing. I want to share one psalm with you. It's not in your handout. And it's one I share frequently, but it is so particularly fitting to this man. The psalm is attributed to King David. It's Psalm 15. And uh, our tradition teaches that these psalms, these poems, are the journal entries of King David. It's his reflections on the questions and the vicissitudes of life. And in one of them, as I've shared before, David asked the question, who at the end of their life is measured for good? Who gets to go to heaven? Who gets to sit beside God? Adonai, mi agurvo chalecha mi ishkan b'har kodshetna. Adonai, who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain? And then this is David's answer to that list of qualities of such a person, the qualities of a mensch, the qualities of Jerry. Those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth within their hearts, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless, but honor those who revere God, who give their word and come what may, do not retract it, who do not exploit others, who do not take bribes. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken. Amen. We don't believe in sainthood. In Judaism, there is no sense of perfection. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Chat GPT already replacing the world. <laughs> there is no sense of perfection in Judaism, but there is progress. And that was really Jerry's life work, life's work. He wasn't a perfect man by any stroke. He would be the first to admit it, but he was always trying to be better. Always trying to make our world better. To improve relationships and friendships and our communities. And that is the man that David, I think, is describing here, whose life is merited for reward, who God looks upon as a gift and a blessing just as we do. I'm going to invite Rabbi Bregman and uh, Cantor Gutman to come and to lead us in Psalm 23 in their unique and particular way. Before uh, we do the psalm, I'd just like to uh, say a few words. This should really only take us till about 3 o'clock. So <laughs> Jerry was my president of the shul from 2000 to 2003. And I, in my 33 years at Temple Shalom, had the unbelievable good fortune of working with incredible men and women in those 33 years. So the story is told that uh, at a bar mitzvah reception, one of the out-of-town guests comes up to the rabbi and says, Hi, I'd like to introduce myself. And uh, I just want to know, Rabbi, would you be able to spend a moment talking to my 12-year-old son? He's thinking of becoming a rabbi. Rabbi says, absolutely, and says to the young man, uh, what's your name? David. He says, okay. What would you like to know? The kid says, so how many drushes or sermons do you give during the course of the week? He said, well, you know, uh, I have an associate, so uh, Shabbos. She does one, I do one, but then there are minions during the week. There could be a funeral, there could be a shiva, there could be uh, weddings or so. I said, average probably maybe four and a half during the week. <laughs> and you, uh, you have a day off? Yes, I, I try to take a day off. And what do you do on Saturdays after uh, services? Well, I go home, I try and spend time with my family. You have a school on Sunday? Yeah, and what do you do on Sunday afternoon? <laughs> Rabbi turns to the father and says, you know, your son doesn't want to be a rabbi. He wants to be the president of the shul. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry consistently asked me one question. What can I do to help you? What can I do to lessen the burden? That was the question that Jerry would ask me week in and week up during those three years of his presidency. And I and my family are eternally grateful to Jerry and 
all of the presidents that I had the unbelievable honor to serve with. It was 2005, the shul was celebrating its 40th anniversary and my 25th year at Temple Shalom and they had a wonderful celebration. And they called me up and uh, for those of you who know, uh, I have this sort of uh, love-hate relationship with uh, a group called the Toronto Blue Jays. <laughs> and they handed me this beautiful t-shirt it had Bregman in 25. They actually traded Delgado so I could get the number. <laughs> and then they gave me a letter from the president of the Blue Jays saying, if you're ever in town beforehand, come, call up, I da 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 da. And who's it from? It's from Paul Godfrey. Now, I don't know if you know, remember Paul Godfrey, very, very involved in politics in Ontario and Toronto and everything else. And I said, who got to Paul Godfrey? <laughs> and somebody turned to me and said, who do you think got the ball? <laughs> of course it was Jerry. By the way, I did go. We were playing the Yankees, and we lost. Godfrey said, you're never going to sit in this uh, uh, box again. Susan and the family, the brothers, thank you. Thank you for sharing Jerry with us and the incredible work that he did. We didn't always agree on politics. I actually thought he was not far enough to the right. <laughs> not so. Cousin. Me is more le David. His son of David. Adonai The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to invite Jerry's brother Alvin to come up to say a few words. Jerry, Mark, uh, Alvin, the three sons of Sam and Ann Lampert growing up in Ottawa. For Mark and me, Jerry was not just our brother, he was our big brother, our very big brother. For us, and I think for many of you we knew Jerry, he was a VIP. He was a VIP all his life, probably for the moment he was born. For us, that explains the six-year gap between him and me. Parents had a focus on him, right? Uh, though perhaps it also had something to do with his, his notable temper. So in, in uh, famous Lampert lore, there was the incident. Um, I think Jerry was in the late teens, maybe. And we were sitting, all of us were at the dinner table, and he was in the bathroom taking a shower. All of a sudden, there is this yelling and screaming and banging on the walls from the bathroom while the hot water had turned cold on Jerry. <laughs> it was unacceptable. So he, he responded by 
carrying the towel rack off the side of the bed. <laughs> so we knew when to stay a little clear of him. As we all know, Jerry never met an organization he did not want to lead, be president of, be chief of, be the principal of, including his shul and his condo board. He had outstanding leadership skills. He had outstanding organizational abilities. But Jerry did not seek his positions because he was power hungry or careerist. Far, far from that. He loved his work. He loved being involved. He loved getting things done and done right. He was fair-minded, professional, reasonable to deal with. Because of this, he bred immense loyalty and respect in all those who worked for him or worked with him. But he was not only a leader in his work life, he was also a linchpin of our family. Of his immediate family here in Vancouver, of brothers Mark and Alvin in Toronto, and of his extended family, his cousins scattered in many places. Our innumerable cousins originally in Ottawa, Toronto, and Detroit looked up to him, as well as a leader, if not the leader, of the extended family. This is clearly evident in the many tributes to Jerry I received by email since we notified everyone of Jerry's passing. I'd like to quote from a couple of, just briefly from a couple of them. One cousin told me, quote, how much Jerry influenced my life. He was a role model for me, unquote. Another cousin wrote, quote, Jerry touched my life and my kids' lives profoundly. Even though he lived far away, we could count on him to be there for us if we reached out, unquote. And several of our Detroit cousins fondly remembered their visits to Ottawa, where in the basement of our home, they fed us three local Ottawa brothers the latest Detroit dance phrases. So, so much love, so much respect for him. He had an impact, a real impact on the lives of so many people. As for me and Jerry, we were very different in many ways. For example, in our politics. Jerry was that now, unfortunately, extinct animal, a progressive conservative, <laughs> and even a red Tory. For those who don't know what that phrase means, it means a conservative with a social conscience. We did grow closer as we became older, for which I am immensely grateful. I will very much miss our regular Sunday phone conversations about family, travel, politics, the world. My big brother Jerry was big in many, many ways. Mark and I could not have asked for a better big brother. We will all always treasure him in his memory. One second, Benjamin. Benjamin, one second. Benjamin, come stand. Come stand right over here, so we can see you better. Okay. I got it. My Zeta, Jerry. He was a wonderful man. If he put his mind to something, he would do it. To him, nothing was impossible. He always was working hard on something, whether it be government, temple shalom, or just keeping the family together. I remember playing chess with him and watching sports games. And my first hockey game that I went to was with him. Right now, he, he is in heaven with God, but it's not fair. I wish he was with us. He would want us to remember him by all of the good times, not the bad times. He will always be with us in the memories in our memories and hearts. I love you, Zeta. Thank you, Benjamin. Dan and Taz, are you speaking also? Yeah. of the pandemic and I'll quote him precisely 
not to be macabre, but the funerals these days are fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let that sink in. <laughs> so this was, of course, to do with the fact with the pandemic, you couldn't always be you know, present. We could live stream today, which I know Jerry would be pleased by. Uh, so for those who could not be here in person, we're glad you could be here virtually. And I know Jerry, Jerry would agree with that. It is diff difficult to capture the role which Jerry played in all of our lives in a few short minutes as he had such a profound, profound impact on us all. Organized, passionate, devoted, intelligent, funny, fiery, caring, proud, charming, meticulous, and above all else, committed to his family. Depending on how you knew Jerry, be it a business acquaintance, friend, neighbor, or family member, I'm sure you can relate to many of these traits and have stories to share of your own. On a personal note, Jerry and his daughter Kylie came into our lives when he met my mom. I was 19 years old and my youngest sibling, Gabby, was 12. As the months passed, it became obvious that Jerry and my mom made each other very happy and that this relationship would last. Eventually, Jerry and my mom bought a home together. Jerry and Kylie became part of a family, as you know, with five chaotic siblings. No easy task. I'm sure the transition for both of them could not have been easy. It was immediately evident that Jerry was extremely organized, a creature of habit with meticulous routines, which served him well in his professional career. He was clearly a well-regarded well leader, of, as you've heard, who was respected by those he interacted with. As I got to know him better, his other traits revealed themselves. He stayed on top of all current events. He dreamed about becoming a contestant on Jeopardy. <laughs> Despite his strong political interests and career, it was quite ironic that he, could, he would never disclose which political party he supported in any given election. My suspicion is he did vote NDP in the most recent election, but I don't know if that's true. It hasn't been he wouldn't want us to know. He had many events he looked forward to each year. He made sure to see each film which was nominated for an Academy Award and looked forward to the awards with much excitement. He and I related to a love of sports. He got us box seat tickets to numerous events, including the Vancouver Indy, the Greater Vancouver Open, and got everyone tickets to the 2010 Olympics, which was amazing. I was always impressed with his many connections as he mingled with local Vancouver celebrities. He spoke fondly of his time at the BC Business Council and Treaty Commission, clearly proud of the work that he did and the people he worked with. As you know, he served as uh, president of the Temple and served as Strata president as well for many years demonstrating the same dedication. He was a leader who inspired confidence in those he met. He was trustworthy and humble, all traits which I admired and tried to emulate. As time passed, I got to see how devoted he was to his family. He became a dad to my siblings and I. Even though I was an adult when we met, he referred to me as his son. Biology did not matter. He stayed well connected to his immediate and extended family, and this also gave us a new, larger extended family, many of whom are here today. As we all took on our own adult lives and met our own partners, Jerry lovingly became a father-in-law and a dad figure to us all. Unexpectedly, later in life, my kids learned they had a new uncle, Uncle Chase. <laughs> <laughs> this is how Jerry referred to it, Chase. His beloved golden noodle of 12 years, Jerry took on dog ownership the way he did everything else, with commitment, dedication, and love. He shared a special bond with Chase that was evident. He was always there to provide advice when asked. He listened carefully to all of our issues. He was interested in everything that we did and was a cheerleader for all our accomplishments. He would often praise us with his signature words. Fabulous, fantastic, wonderful, <laughs> excellent. I'm sure you can hear those resonate. Yeah. He loved to travel and my mom went, he and my mom went on many adventures together around the world. He was a storyteller. If you asked about his trips, he was always ready to share his photo albums, carefully detailed with a story to tell for each picture. He loved all of his grand grandchildren devotedly, so proud of them all, displaying each of their photos on the mantle with such care. He always wanted to hear what they had to say, be it big or small, and was always in their corner. He was always there to attend every event, birthday, holiday gathering, school play, and concert. He was a source of strength to them all. I could stand here and tell stories for a long time. 
<coughs> but I know that you have your own, your own Jerry story. Be it a friend, grandpa, sorry, friend, colleague, neighbor, brother, brother-in-law, cousin, uncle, father, father-in-law, grandpa story. The story that brought you here today. I know the anecdotes could, could and will continue. There would be enough to fill an entire book or two. The stories that would contribute to the memoirs he wanted to write, but did not get to. In his final weeks, given his pension for organization and control, Jerry asked my mom to bring him a copy of the Saturday obituaries and a pen and paper. <laughs> he wanted to write his own obituary <laughs> and made sure to select the right picture he wanted to slay as well. His need to be organized and structured as well as his humor stayed with him until the end. He would raise his glass in a toast each time he took a sip of his water with his medication. When he could not speak anymore, he blew kisses. Sadly, he could not write his own obituary. However, Jerry, you will, don't need to worry about it. The memories and stories will carry on. We've got this from here. It's all taken care of. You're here with us and we love you. I just wanted to share a poem about my grandpa. I chose to write about my favorite memory of him, which is walking with him and his dog Chase, who we all know he loved a lot. So, um, this is called Walking with Grandpa. Step and step, side by side, as we trudge familiar paths, his pace beside me steady and brisk yet never too fast. From my rushing feet to keep up, treading in shoes tried and tested. These boots were made for walking, he'd say. One of his many songs and anthems. Sure and stable, he'd walk along, conversation trailing behind us, and the sun would catch the twinkle in his eye like stars that shone with pride. Surrounded by skin, creased by the well-used laughter and emotions of decades gone by. Lines etched as deep as the bark of the trees that watched us pass, and a brown known to furrow in frustration and thought. Stories wove through the grass around us, swaying with the whispers of years past and the tide of the wind that followed. His laughter would ring out, tracing tales of years gone by, told with as much vigor as if they'd been just yesterday. A memoir written in the hearts of those whose lives he touched. He captured my attention, wrapped eyes and ears following, eager to hear his stories. These walks were companionship, interwoven with sporadic stops for friendly chats. He was as entwined with his community as the words roots were with the ground. As I traced my way along my path, from baby to toddler and child to teen, he shared his stories and listened to my own. Though he lived more experiences than most, he listened to me with equally devoted attention, eagerly awaiting the person I'd become. And it was easier to grow, knowing he was there watching and cheering me on. The man beside me was a pillar of strength, the beacon of light and love to lay the foundation of any childhood. He was wisdom and experience, warmth and light, kindness and gentle careful words. He was joy as pure as the springtime breeze, steady and reliable as his favorite pair of shoes, constant as the sunrise lighting the sky each fading day. Life seemed just as orderly as a neat stack of books, knowing he was there. And even as we gathered to bid farewell to my grandfather, even though he no longer treads this earth which he walked for so long, he will walk beside us forever in memory. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, everyone that shared memories. There'll be more opportunities to do that back at the house and Sunday night at the Shiva as well. Um, I want to add a few words. I'm, I'm aware that you're all standing, and I'll try to keep this concise. Jerry's Bar Mitzvah Torah portion was by Gosh. I don't memorize the Torah portion of every member of my congregation, but I know that one. And I know that from the book of Genesis. The part of the story where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers many years of harrowing events after they had thrown him into the pit, sold him to slavery. As I said, I don't remember every bar mitzvah portion of every congregant, certainly not Jerry, whose bar mitzvah I was not alive for. But I remember this because when I first really got to know Jerry, he accepted our invitation to serve as the co-chair of Temple Shalom's 50th anniversary tour writing project with Ann Andrews. And Jerry and Susan, I don't remember this, Susan, you came into my office and explained that you wanted to dedicate the Parsha, that particular Torah portion, because Jerry had such a formative and meaningful memories 
of learning to chant every word of it and his Haftorah when he was 13 years old as he prepared for his bar mitzvah. He told me how he studied for the whole year with Reverend Weisbord, learning trope and chanting the entire Parsha and Haftorah at his Orthodox synagogue, Beth Shalom, in Ottawa. And I want to mention also that Jerry and Susan also made a dedication in memory of Susan's parents, Becky and Roy, who were dedicated members of our congregation and contributed greatly to creating and supporting the Jewish home that Susan and the children were raised in. There's an old rabbinic saying that sometimes the student chooses the Torah portion, but other times the Torah portion chooses the student. 65 years or so later after his bar mitzvah, it is apparent to me that in Jerry's case, it was an instance of the Torah portion choosing the student. Vayigash is perhaps the most political Torah portion in the whole book of Genesis, maybe the whole Torah. Joseph is in the position of essentially vice president of Egypt in a unique position to help his family and the nascent people of Israel as they flee a famine in the land seeking shelter in Egypt. And so Joseph sets his own hurt feelings and traumas aside and he sees the humanity in his brother's plight and that of his people. Uniquely positioned to help, Joseph does what Jerry would have done. He organizes and mobilizes all of the resources and all the influence at his disposal to secure safe haven for his brethren. And ultimately, when his brothers, with fear and trepidation that Joseph will seek retribution for the heinous acts against him, are overcome by shame and remorse, Joseph, like Jerry, I am certain, would have said in that same instance, Joseph comforts them. He says in Torah, it's okay, fear not. You meant it for bad, but God, God meant it for good. It was not you who sent me here. It was gone. It has all been ordained from above to save us and the entire region from famine, and I am in a unique position to help, and that's just what I'm going to do. And that was as much a creed and guiding principle in Jerry's life as it was in our biblical patriarch, Joseph, the hero of his Bar Mitzvah Torah portion. Jerry would, time and again, use his skills as an organizer, orator, politician, wise counsel, in the best and most menschy sense of those words, to help others, to rectify the wrongs in society, to work behind the scenes, to make the seemingly impossible possible. Jerry was a humble man. He had no discernible ego, not that I encountered at least. It was so rarely about him, but it was always about the project, the mission, the group that he was working on whose behalf. If that mission was his family, he gave 100%, holding the family together, staying in touch, connecting them with each other again and again, and the very, in the end, very much like the role Joseph played in our tour portion. The same was true of the political campaigns and administrations that he worked on, or when he was president of the BC Business Council, or president of the Temple Shalom, or president of the Strata, or his work with the Treaty Commission. Jerry was mission and purpose first. He kept saying that he would stop, slow down, but he never really did. I don't think he had that gear. In part, that was just his nature but it was also about his deep commitment to tikkun olam, to repairing the world, the Jewish value, to repair and restore the world that he learned from his parents. Growing up in a traditional Jewish home in Ottawa, living within two blocks of the majority of his family who modeled for him, who not only surrounded him with love, but modeled Jewish values, a work ethic and a devotion to family that shaped the core of this man that he would grow to become. Family hard work, loyalty. Those were the values instilled in him from his father and that he passed on to his children and grandchildren. He was a natural leader and enjoyed the role from a very young age. He was an older brother who taught Alvin and Mark by his good example, as you've heard, treating others with courtesy and respect that continued throughout his life. Jerry loved working with people being on the ground and in the mix, planning and implementing political projects and strategies. His natural organizational skills were only enhanced by his work in politics and were self-evident in his personality and his behaviors. 
Jerry, as I said, had a routine for everything. What he ate for breakfast. How he walked his beloved dog, Chase. <laughs> Jerry was a meticulous planner. I saw that firsthand when he worked with Anne to plan our tour project in intricate detail. And Susan, you saw it in how Jerry seemed to enjoy planning the trips that the two of you loved to take even more than he loved going on them with you. When he was on the trip, he was planning the next one. He loved to get into the details. He was a voracious consumer of news and information, always had to know what was going on in the world, not just politics, but sports too. To watch Jerry cheer or bemoan his beloved teams, or really any sporting event, was to behold a super fan, deeply invested in whatever team or sport it was, and the outcome of the game that Jerry was watching was often, Jerry watching Jerry watch the game was often more entertaining than what was happening on the field as he expressed so much passion, but perhaps even more than the players. And that was Jerry. He was all in. He did everything in everything he did. His fiery personality would come out and be directed seldom at people, but often at inanimate objects. Toilets that didn't work properly, Ikea furniture assemblies that went sideways. Jerry would yell and scream and throw pieces of that unassembled furniture or desk all around. Frustrated that things did not work as intended, it was a sight to behold. His passionate disappointment in the poor planning or design of something. You knew he was thinking that this had to be, that had this been his responsibility, he would never have permitted such poor outcomes to be the final result. He'd keep trying to make it better because he was a hopeful person. He believed in the power of individuals and groups to affect positive and lasting change. And that made Jerry an excellent political advisor, a spectacular temple and strata president, but most of all, it made him a loving, empathic, dedicated, and unforgettably inspiring husband, father, brother, grandfather, and friend. It made him a Joseph, a dreamer of dreams, who could make those dreams a reality through hard work, wisdom, and his humanity. In my last visit with Jerry, just a few days before he died, we sat in that horribly empty, isolating room at BGH. My wife, Sharon, had sent me with a plant to bring to his room to bring some life and cheer to the starkness of the surroundings. But I soon realized I didn't need the plant. Jerry brought the life. Jerry brought the life. Not only in that room, but in every room. He was so happy to see me, but I don't think it was me. He was so happy to see everyone who visited him or sent him notes or phone calls. Struggling to find his words, the cancer jumbling his thoughts, one part of Jerry's indomitable personality could not be repressed. He was so filled with gratitude, so filled with appreciation for life and all of those that are in it with him, the people in his life. We talked about what was happening to his body, how the cancer was relentless. Now time was growing short, and how as much as he wanted more time, as much as he had so much more life to live, he also told me at every visit that he felt so blessed by his family and the life that he had lived, that he had no regrets other than that he didn't have more time with all of you, the ones he loved so much. Even in the midst of all that was bad that was happening to his body, Jerry, like Joseph, found the good. He found the blessing. He made a lasting difference in the lives of individuals, of groups, of whole political systems. And that part of Jerry, that part will live on with everyone and everything he touched. It will live on for generations. May his memory, like his life, always be a blessing. Amen. I'm going to ask the pallbearers now to join me at the back of the coach. So we can bring the casket and place it here for the chanting of El Malay Rachamim and then the procession to the gravesite. So if Ed, Taz, Mark, Rob, Yossi, and Stephen could stand with us at the back of the coach and if we can just clear a path right here, we'll bring the casket to this spot and then chant El Malay Rachamim. Paul Bears can come stand shoulder to shoulder, three on a sonnet. 
And I'd like to ask Benjamin to come as well to act as an honorary call bearer with us. If those that are seated could please rise. spirit of the universe grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to jerry who has entered eternity O god of mercy let him find refuge in your eternal presence in the shadow of your wings let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life god is his inheritance may he rest in peace and we say together amen friends we're going to proceed in procession now down to the graveside if you allow the family to follow behind the casket and then if you could all all follow with us and we'll assemble around the grave for interment in the cottage.
ואם עצים ורחמים אדם, באמת נופלים ועושה דברים ומכיר אחרים. אוקיי, כל מי שנאפר, מי כמוך ועוד גבולות, הוא בדיוק נורא, לא באמת נופל I could ask the family to come close to me for a moment.
but customarily the ribbon is worn by siblings, children, and spouse. Friends, we're going to do that one final act, that final mitzvah that cannot be repaid. And that is to be the gentle hands that bring Jerry to his final rest. Pull the covers of earth around him and tuck him in. Before that, I wanted to share with you a poem that's inside your handout. When I die, if you need to weep, cry for someone walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around others and give them what you need from me. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands and souls touch souls. You can love me most by sharing your joys, multiplying your good deeds. You can love me most by letting me live in your eyes and not in your mind. And when you say Kaddish for me, remember what our Torah teaches. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that is left of me is love, give me away. I'm going to ask the family to come forward now to place earth. As they do that, I'd like to ask you, please, if we could make two lines along the road right behind you, facing each other, so on opposite sides of the road facing inward. After the family has placed earth, we're going to escort them out of the cemetery, back to their cars and to their home and place of mourning, where they will receive you later uh, this afternoon or after we leave here, and also where they will be a shiva at 7.30 on Sunday night, and all that information is on your handout. So if I could ask everyone else to please make those two lines facing each other along the road, and then we'll come back to Place Earth, all of us together.
Friends, we're going to recite the Kaddish prayer at this time. Okay, if it goes down. It's okay. Amen. Yoma Dibra Amen. Amen. Amen.
God console you. Among the mourners, Zion. at all. Friends, those of you that have the program, it has God's name on it, so we don't just throw it away. If you like to keep it, of course you can, but if not, we actually place it inside the grave, which is the proper way within our tradition to dispose of both Shemot printed documents with God's holy name on it. So if you'd like to, you can place it in the grave and we'll surround Jerry with the tour. able to we need to fully cover the casket with earth so if those are able to help us with that it's good thank you
had to come out. Thank you, everyone. We'll finish the race. Thank you.